and uh, I uh, am affiliated to Institute for Advanced Studies on Asia. It's an uh, Asian Studies Institute at the University of Tokyo. Um, the first speaker is myself, uh, so without further ado, uh, with your permission, I begin my presentation. Uh, I have changed the title of my presentation. Instead of Said Sharikology 12 years later, uh, the title is Said Sharikology Personal and Collective Endeavors to Define a New Research Field. Uh, first of all, I want to be <coughs> turn on the timer here, but it doesn't work. So can you lend me your... Oh, yes, thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank colleagues at Kenan Rifai Center for Sufi Studies, Kyoto University, especially its founding director and uh, an esteemed friend of mine, Professor Yasushi Tonaga, as well as the other institutions involved in the organization for their kind invitation to this library, lively forum of scholarly interactions. It's a great honor for me to talk to this audience with so many illustrious scholars from Turkey, the United States, China, and Japan, if all of you on the program are here. Uh, I will talk about what I call Saido Sharifology today, but I will not talk much about its contents. Instead, I will talk more about what I have done by now in order to promote this original framework of research. I understand that this conference is meant to mark the beginning of the full-scale research activities of Kenan Rifai Center for Sufi Studies. Since my endeavors to promote Saido Sharifology have always been supported by the colleagues who now gather at the Kenan Rifai Center as regular or adjunct members, I think it is useful that we review the history of Saido Sharifology together at this moment. Also, I hope that my autobiographical account, this will be an autobiographical account in fact, uh, will somehow benefit and encourage younger members of our research community. Perhaps not so important, but at least I can report that I have done something in this regard, I believe. Uh, if I could do it, then you will also be able to do it. Uh, so that's my uh, message to the younger uh, members of the community. And lastly, I also do hope that my talk about Saido Sharifology will also suggest to uh, foreign guests atten attending the conference how Japanese Islamists are doing their research and to quote from the symposium's uh, prospectus, how we are configuring Islamic studies. Uh, here in Japan. Okay, I uh, begin my, uh, to read my manuscript basically. Uh, I begin by explaining what Saido Sharifology is about. The Muslim population around the world comprises a great number of people putatively related to the Prophet Muhammad and therefore called by the honorific titles such as Sayyid or Sharif. For many of you who specialize in Sufism, it should be easy to remember at least some names of Sufi masters and saints who are believed to be or have been a Sayyid or Sharif. It is by no means only in Sufism that some special significance has been accorded to the lineage of Sayyids and Sharifs. Among the heads of the state of Muslim majority countries today, we can easily count the kings of Morocco, Jordan, and the supreme leader of Iran, and the sultan of Brunei as claimant to the prophetic descent. Thus, the lineage clearly has some political significance too. Moreover, a merchant at a transaction may enjoy some additional trust because of his title, Sayyid or Sharif, and a bigger even a beggar may be able to expect some additional income on account of the green cap he wears as a sign of the prophetic descent. 
In short, the prophetic descent of Sayyids and Sharifs can benefit its possessors in so many settings. Sayyid Sharifology is a term I began to use in earnest in a program, programmatic essay I published towards the end of 2004 in order to highlight Sayyids and Sharifs as a serious subject of research. In spite of the conspicuous presence of Sayyids and Sharifs in so many regions in the Islamic world, the question as to who those people are, in both social and biological terms, or as to what meanings have been attached to their lineage in different milieus, had not been considered a serious subject of research until, say, about two decades ago. In response to such, in response to such a situation, Sayyid Sharifology was conceived as a framework that would not only bring Sayyids and Sharifs to the foreground, but allow discussing Sayyids and Sharifs of different regions together as a people belonging uh, to one and the same social category, but settled in different milieus. I know that this neology, Said Sharifology, is rather unpopular among those who are good at English. I didn't know that, that uh, it sounded so awkward. Uh, some proposing the simpler Saidology or Sharifology others objecting to the idea itself of coining any new somethingology. But at least for the time being, I'd like to uh, go on with it. This is meant to be a research field that studies the kinfolk of the prophet as a whole, whether they are called Sayyids in some regions or Sharifs in others. It is I who came to conceive the usefulness of the concept of Sayyid Sharifology and began to advocate it. But I have not been alone. The research group Professors Akahori and Tonaga have led for decades now in order to study saint veneration, Sufism and Tariqa, and the complex formed by those three phenomena recognize the relevance of Sayyid Sharifology to all its three thematic axes and included it on its research agenda. In a sense, thus, Said Sharifology can be recognized as a small area of research that represents original joint endeavors by part of the community of scholars working on Islam in Japan. It was when I was doing research for my senior thesis on notable politics in a local society in Khorasan from the 10th to the 12th century that I took interest in Sayyids and Sharifs for the first time. The family which came to dominate the local society after the decline of the Sarjuks around the middle of the 12th century happened to be a family with prophetic descent. However, my interest in Sayyids and Sharifs remained ephemeral at that time as I was trying to explain the rise and fall of different families in terms of the different means of violence available to them. I was not interested so much in uh, the symbolic dimension of the uh, local politics. I came to think more seriously about Sayyids and Sharifs when I chose the topic for my MA thesis. I decided to read uh, books on genealogy specializing in Sayyids and Sharifs compiled mainly in the 11th and the 12th century, which has just begun to be published by the Marashi Najafi Library in Qom. Finally, I wrote a thesis on the genealogical control of Sayyids and Sharifs that was being carried out jointly by the genealogists specializing in Sayyids and Sharifs and the natives the heads of the local communities of Sayyids and Sharifs. As I furthered my study, it became clearer and clearer that I should understand the lineages of Sayyid Sharif families as social constructs rather than biological facts, and that I could therefore study it as a material of social history. It was also when I was pre preparing my MA thesis that I was introduced to Abdel Ahad Sebti's doctoral dissertation, which Sebti had written about 10 years before. 
70s was an excellent study on the genealogies of Sharifs compiled in Fez in Morocco from the 15th to the 20th century. By putting the compilations of different works in their respective social contexts, Sebti has shown the trajectory of Sharif's position in Fasi society. I learned from Sebti's study how one could look at social changes beyond boring genealogical texts. At the same time, Sebti's studies study also served as a gateway to other studies of Moroccan Sharifs, which I read rather extensively. I therefore came to understand that as far as Morocco was concerned, there was a good accumulation of studies and even a common narrative regarding the historical development of the Sharif phenomenon, Sharifism, called in French, in that country. I also found phenomena that I thought had a parallel in Iran, such as a Mahdist movement with profound uh, interrelation with the reverence for Sharifs or Sayyids around the 15th century. This happy experience of profiting from Moroccan studies in studying the Iranian case certainly made me, made me believe that no study, uh, excuse me, to study Sayyids and Sharifs, one has to look at the subject not only locally, but also in terms of the whole Islamic world. But it was not only I who was thinking that way. In Italy was a full-fledged professor who was thinking a similar thing. I was about 25 at that time, she was already a full-fledged professor. The next important event on my, on my journey with Saïd Sharifology was my participation in the first ever international academic gathering on the subject of Saïd and Sharifs. The International Colloquium, the role of the Saudat Ashraf in Muslim history and civilization, held in Rome in March 1998 by Bianca Maria Scalcia Amoretti. This was a meeting that aimed exactly at gathering information and studies concerning Saïds and Sharifs scattered all over the Islamic world. I was very happy to be able to participate uh, in that event, which for the first time presented Saïds and Sharifs as a serious subject of research that should be studied through comparison among different local manifestations throughout the Islamic world. But the Rome conference was not perfect. As Scalja Amoretti herself wrote in the proceedings that, quote unquote, we intended to offer debates and not certainties, information and not evaluations, its scope did not go beyond gathering information from different region, regions of the Islamic world. As a result, many of the presentations made at the occasion were no more than mere portrayals of Sayyids and Sharifs from their respective regions of concern. Even after the Rome conference, I thought that there still was a need to clarify what was already known about the Sayyid Sharif phenomenon as a whole and thereby facilitate the study of that phenomenon through the combination of regional and comparative examinations. I gradually came to hope that I do that job myself. First, in 1999, I published a Japanese, in Japanese a brief essay entitled Research Trends of Science Sharifology, and a book chapter with the title Science and Sharifs, the King King's folk of Muhammad and their pedigree. Then in 2004, a programmatic essay in English entitled Towards the Formation of Saïd Sharifology was published. And that was followed immediately by the publication in 2005 of uh, its Japanese version. It must be noted here that the two programmatic essays were published in the publications of the research group led by professors Akahori and Tonaga. The English version was published in a special issue of the Journal of Sophia Asian Studies, whose title was Towards New Perspectives on Studies on Sufis, Saints, and Sayyid Sharifs. The publication that carried the Japanese version was merely titled uh, Mysticism and Saint Veneration in Islam, but 
the book consisted of four parts that were entitled respectively Saint Veneration, Tasawwuf, Tariqa, Sayyid, Shalus. I was lucky that I had colleagues who showed me what I was trying to do really mattered then. The programmatic essays consisted of two main chapters. The first chapter was devoted to the state of the art. It showed that except for uh, concerning Moroccan Sharifs and Hadrami Sayyids, there was a dearth of studies on Sayyids and Sharifs. Then the second chapter presented my proposal of some lines of inquiry for future studies. I, of course, highlighted the use and need of comparative method pointed out some possible points of comparison, and then emphasized the need for studying different Muslim discourses on the prophetic lineage. From when I was writing the programmatic essays, I hoped that they would one day serve as the prospectus of a second conference on Sayyids and Sharifs after Rome, which I also hoped to host, hoped to host myself in Japan. That hope was realized in the International Conference on the Role and Position of Sayyid Sharifs in Muslim Societies, held in Tokyo in September 2009. The conference comprised 15 presentations, 4 by Japanese scholars and 11 by foreign scholars. In order to let the presenters know what I ex expected from the conference, I asked them, when I sent my invitations, to read my programmatic essays. I also propose the following three thematic axes for the conference. A, Muslim discourses about the family of Muhammad or Sayyid Sharifs. B, historical experiences and historiography of Sayyid Sharifs in different Muslim societies. And C, anthropological and sociological approaches to Sayyid Sharifs today. <coughs> this way, I could hold a second conference on Sayyid Sharifology about 11 years after the long conference. The proceedings of this conference came out in 2012 as a volume in the Islamic Area Studies series published by Routridge. Again, thanks to the organizational link the Akahori Tonaga research group then had with the Islamic Area Studies project, a large granting aid research project that was published, uh, that was publishing the series. I think that the Tokyo conference was a big success. Importantly, no paper at the conference ended up with a mere portrayal of individuals or families that claimed the prophetic descent, but used concrete case studies to approach Said Said Sharif phenomenon. The proceedings also include three chapters that specifically discuss Muslim discourses concerning the station of Saidis and Sharifs the like of which was missing in the long conference. <laughs> the geographical and chronological coverage was also as wide as long conference, that is, from Al-Andalus to Indonesia and from the 7th to the 12th, uh, 21st century. All in all, I believe that the Tokyo conference showed a considerable measure of progress in terms mainly of how the subject is approached in comparison with the long conference. By the way, I was not totally idle during the period between the Tokyo Conference in 2009 and the publication of the proceedings in 2012. Among other things, I published in 2010 a booklet entitled The Holy Family of Islam, the Kinfolk of the Prophet Muhammad in Japanese to acquaint the general leadership in Japan with Sa'is and Shaifs. This was again made possible because of my affiliation to the Akahori Tonaga Research Group and the group's affiliation to the Islamic Area Studies Project. I also taught in March 2010 a five-day intensive course entitled Sayyid's Sharifs, the Kinsfolk of the Prophet in Muhammad, uh, Muslim Societies in Princeton. Further, I gave talks at different places uh, including one at George Mason University in Virginia, which my friend Professor Jamil Aydin kindly hosted. So, this was the outline of what I have done so far to promote research on Sayyids and Shahibs. 
with the help of the members of the Akahori Tohonaga Research Group, many of whom are present in this room. Uh, many of you chaired or presented uh, papers at that conference and have uh, uh, given me critical <coughs> comments uh, throughout the course of my research. You may think that it was only about writing several articles, holding a small conference, and publishing an edited volume. And it is true that it is, it's all about those small things. But I thought it was worth sharing, especially with younger colleagues gathering here. I mean, my experience was worth sharing with younger colleagues gathering here, whose ambitious venturing is important for the advancement of scholarship. I am sure that the Akahori Tonaga Research Group, now with the institutional support of the Kenan Rifai Center for Sufi Studies, will help you as they have helped me in my endeavors. But I will rival you uh, in actually search of the sponsorship by Kenan uh, <laughs> if I <coughs> Center for Sufi Studies because I'd also like to continue my side research. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, so after this uh, first presentation, in Japanese called Tsuyuharai, that means not trace blazer, but no, no, trail blazer, but you, you know, when in the morning uh, water dews are on the glass, the first person, the page of a road, will walk in front of the road to get rid of that water dews. My presentation. I hope served as uh, that Tsuyuharai for the second presentation uh, by Takahashi K, uh, who is affiliated to Sofia University and, uh, of course, is a member of uh, the Akahori Tonaga Research Group I uh, repeatedly referred to. Uh, the title of his presentation is uh, the institutional origin of the Ulama Sufi dichotomy in modern Egypt. Please, Dr. Adas, if you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Morimoto, for the introduction. Maybe my presentation is the second Tsiwarai for the <laughs> third presentation. OK, so, so first, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the organizer for this conference for inviting me to, you know, to, the, to read my paper at this conference. So it's my great pleasure for me to be here with you. So, um, okay, all right, yeah. So, please allow me to read my paper. So today, Today, I will be talking about the historical context in which what might be called the Ulama Sufi dichotomy was established. This is Ulama Sufi dichotomy, so it's namely the view contraposing the Islamic scholarly tradition and the Sufi tradition and labeling the former as orthodox Islam and the latter as heterodox. Well, I know that uh, these orthodox and heterodox are problem problematic terms, but allow me to use it for convenience for now. Anyway, so these orthodox and Islamic heterodox Islam and uh, such dichotomy has long been employed by both Western academics and the Muslim intellectuals as a framework for understanding Islam. Although there have always always been tension between the outer and the inner dimension of Islam, the binary view con uh, constituted by these two traditions along the lines of orthodoxy and heterodoxy should be considered a modern construct. So the previous studies have already discussed that this framework has its roots in early orientalist discourses on Islam and Sufism, 
which con contrasted Sufism with mainstream Islamic beliefs and practice. Well, it's, uh, it was discussed by Professor Arnstad uh, yesterday. But it, uh, it has also been pointed out that later Muslim intellectuals, especially modernist thinkers, internalized these orientalist discourses and they were actively involved in diffusing that view in Muslim society. While fully aware of the di discursive process that led to the framing of this dichotomy, I'm going to discuss the framing process from a slightly different point of view. I will here examine this issue in relation to the socio-political changes of modern Muslim society. And this paper focuses on the specific, specific case of the Sufi Tariqa in modern Egypt. So in Egypt, the newly established Mehmet Ali government introduced a centralized control system over Egyptian Tariqa in 1812. And since then, the Egyptian Tariqa have been under the supervision of a unitary authority. The centralized control system consequently dissociated Sufi tariqas from the Islamic scholarly establishment, creating what where I call a distinct Sufi territory in the Egyptian religious landscape. My hypothesis is that the creation of this Sufi territory served as the institutional foundation for the framing of the Ulama Sufi dichotomy in contemporary Egyptian society. In this paper, I will illustrate how the Sufi territory was constructed by chronologically following the process of the institutionalization of Sufi tariqas throughout the 19th and the early 20th century. Okay, let's start. So first, let me briefly overview the status of the Sufis before the state control began. Well, generally speaking, Sufism was fully integrated in Ottoman Egyptian society as part of mainstream or orthodox, if I may say, Islamic tradition. It was quite common to see a person being at once an alim, Islamic scholar, and a Sufi. Abdul Rahman Jabalti, the best known historian from this period, includes a number of biographies of ulama in his chronology. In these biographies, it describes that many students pursuing Islamic scholarship in Azhar, the most celebrated madrasa in Cairo, simultaneously received the Sufi training from their teacher. And also, a head of several Sufi families were among the religious notables in Ottoman Egyptian society, along with other high-ranking ulama, such as Sheikh al Azhar, Adha, the president of Azhar. One of the most celebrated Sufi families in Egypt was the Bakri family, and its hereditary head, Sheikh al Bakri, was highly esteemed and possessed religious authority over other Sufis. Okay, and in 1805, Mehmet Ali was appointed viceroy of Egypt. Once rising to power, he introduced a barrage of innovative measures to strengthen his power. It was under the new regime's centralizing process that the state control of Egyptian Sufi tariqas was initiated. In 1812, Mehmet Ali issued a decree declaring Sheikh al Bakri's jurisdiction over Sufi tariqas in Egypt. Sheikh al Bakri was authorized to supervise the activities of the tariqas and, and to intervene in their affairs. By virtue of this decree, Sheikh al-Bakri was now not only the head of an influential Sufi family, but the administrative official in charge of Egyptian Sufis. From this moment on, Egyptian Sufi tariqas were placed under state control. It is clear that this control system depended on the traditional religious authority of the Bakri family. But nevertheless, it represents a noble institution in that it gave Shaykh al-Bakri 
exclusive jurisdiction over Egyptian troops. The political intention behind the creation of such exclusive power is clear. It was designed to undermine the power of other religious notables. Those religious notables who were connected to, to Sufi tariqas were now subject to that unitary authority. Shankar Mabri's exclusive jurisdiction was further consolidated by an agreement reached between Shaykh al Bakri and Shaykh al-Azhar in 1847. This agreement confirmed that the affairs related to Sufi tariqas should be under the jurisdiction of the Shaykh al Bakri and that the Shaykh al-Azhar would not interfere in such matters. The agreement between two religious leaders had major bearing on the relationship between ulama and Sufis in Egypt. It symbolically declared the separation of territories belonging to ulama and Sufis at the institutional level. Now Sufis had their own territory protected by Shaykh al Bakri uh, from the intervention of ulama of Asa. In fact, many Sufi sheikhs welcomed Shaykh al Bakri's jurisdiction over them because this tariqa control system actually functioned to maintain the status quo Protect, protecting the blessed interests of the Sufi sheikhs. So to sum up the impact of the institutionalization of Egyptian Sufi tariqas under state control discussed here, it created a, the distinct Sufi territory in the Egyptian religious landscape, independent from that of the ulama. Okay, so the creation of distinct Sufi territories territory raises question concerning the territory of the ulama. So what about the ulama's territory? So I will now leave the tariqa and turn to Azhar. It is worth mentioning that reconfiguration of ulama territory was also taking place in Azhar during the 19th century. So relying on finding of findings of previous studies, let me briefly outline what happened in Azhar. First, it must be noticed that the subject the ulama was studying in Azhar during the Ottoman period were not limited to the narrowly defined, defined religious sciences. Students were learning other subjects such as mathematics, astronomy, philosophy, music, and even medicine. So Sufi literatures were also regularly being read and studied. Ulama in Ottoman Egypt were therefore not just experts on religious sciences, but in fact a people of, uh, of wide-ranging wide education. By the end of the 19th century, however, Azhar was moving towards specialization in the religious sciences. Previous studies have identified several factors contributing to the specialization. First, the founding of technical schools by the new regime led to a drastic change in the educational settings surrounding Azhar. Since these new schools attracted students who hoped to learn non-religious subjects, the significance of studying such subjects in Azhar diminished. Second, Azhar witnessed a rapid increase in the number of students, mainly because of Mehmet Ali's heavy-handed measures, including conscri conscription and corvée. The number of students simply exceeded the capacity of Azhar, and the administration had to take measures to lower their numbers. This eventually catalyzed the introduction of a graduation examination. In 1872, an examination system was introduced in Azhar for the first time in, in its long history. The, the examination determined Azhar's specialization in the religious sciences. Eleven major fields of religious sciences were set as the subjects of the examination, establishing them as requirement for a person to be recognized as a qualified alim. Meanwhile, other subjects, including Sufism, were no longer relevant to the qualification of alim, or at least from the institutional point of view. So in a way, Azhar became technical school, specializing in specific specific religious sciences by the end of the 19th century. So to sum up the main points discussed here is uh, as a result of Mehmet Ali's modernizing policy, Sufis and Uramas were 
institutionally divided into two isolated territories. So, starting from the end of the 19th century, Egypt witnessed the rise of Islamic reformist movements. Under the leadership of modernist thinkers such as Muhammad Abdul and Rashid Reda, these movements advocated the reform of major religious institutions as represented by Azhar and Sufi tariqas. Reformers criticized both Azhar and the tariqas for their adherence to traditional customs, resisting any sort of changes from their medieval form, and suggested that as a result of this, they had become dysfunctional in contemporary society. And that is why they should be reformed. Their complaint about Sufis include the lack of scholarly understanding of Islam, association with popular beliefs, and peculiar doctrines and rituals not supported by Islamic law. As for Azhar, its, its very specialization in religious science, sciences was criticized as symbolizing the ulama's lack of interest in practical sciences. Although ref reformers regarded these defects attributed to Tariqas and Azhar as traditional characters inherited by generations of Sufis and Ulama, like from medieval time, they were actually created or perhaps amplified by the institutionalization of Sufi Tariqas and the reconfiguration of scholarship in Azhar, both of which took place in the 19th century. The dichotomy of two traditions were also taken by these modernist misinka as given. Maybe such dichotomy was the reality of the end of the 19th century Egyptian religious landscape. Because by then, the two traditions were in fact dissociated with each other at the institutional level. One of the major issues discussed in the reformist movement was the resolution of the ulama Sufi dichotomy. In order to reconcile Islamic scholarly tradition and the Sufi tradition, some reformers proposed the, the interesting argument that Sufis and ulamas were essentially identical. As an example, Alomit presents the argument of Muhammad Zawahiri, a reformist alim who was later appointed Shaykh al Azhar. According to Zawahiri, Sufism is defined as the practice of error the Islamic scholarly knowledge. And based on this definition, he argues that if ulama are possessors of Islamic scholarly knowledge, then they must behave according to the knowledge. And furthermore, those who behave according to the knowledge or practice the knowledge, or literally translate it, those who uh, uh, translate the, those, pra those practitioners of the knowledge, these people are Sufis. The logical conclusion of this argument is that the knowledge of Sufis itself Islamic scholarly knowledge. Therefore, Sufism and Islamic scholarly knowledge are, by definition, identical. Pressed by these reformers, the Tariqa reform was conducted between 1895 and 1905 at the behest of Muhammad Tawfiq al-Bakri, the then Shaykh al-Bakri. Muhammad Tawfiq himself was a modernist thinker and a stalwart supporter of Islamic reform. His Tariqa reform was driven by the same basic theory as, the, as that presented by Zawahi. Muhammad Tawfiq defined Sufism as no other than the practice of the knowledge, ilm, based on Islamic law, and attempted to standardize Sufi doctrines and practices conform, conforming to the law. However, as a consequence, his historical reform did not receive favorable responses from other reformers. One reason relevant to the discussion in this paper is that, may, that many reformers did not accept the leadership. Muhammad Tawfiq's reform was intended to standardize doctrine and practice of Sufi tariqas while maintaining his jurisdiction over tariqas and keeping the vested interests of individual Sufi sheikhs intact. For many reformers, however, such defensive stance of Sufi sheikhs was a real obstacle to reform. Not satisfied with Muhammad Tawfiq's tariqa reform, a few more attempts at reforming Egyptian tariqas were conducted 
in the early 20th century. These attempts were initiated by the reform-minded ulama of Azhar, who tried to reform tariqas by incorporating them under the supervision of Azhar. All these attempts failed, though, thanks to opposition from Sufi sheikhs. As it turned out, Sufis were successful in resisting the, the intervention from the ulama and in protecting their own territory. However, the failure of a series of tariqa reforms revealed that the very existence of distinct Sufi territory had prevented Sufis from claiming their orthodoxy. Because Islamic orthodoxy was already embodied by the ulama and their institutions, the Azhar, uh, the, uh, the institution, the Azhar, the Sufis' belief, beliefs and practices were regarded as heterodox as long as Sufis remained outside of that ulama territory. And Tawfiq at Tawil, an Egyptian historian, got the point of its kind of dilemma of Egyptian Sufis in, early, in the early 20th century. In his study on Sufism in the Ottoman Egypt, published in 1946, he questioned the identity of Sufis by referring to the Muhammad Tawfiq al-Bakri's definition of Sufism. So I would like to conclude my paper by quoting his comments. So he says, according to him, you know, he was talking about the tariqa reform, and then finally he says, so why cannot we say that there is no longer a distinction between Sufis and Fukaha legal scholars? Didn't you, Yumi is a kind of you know, Muhammad Tafik, you know, didn't you say that Sufism was no other than the practice of the knowledge, El based on Islamic law? And if that same definition does not apply to Fukahas, then what are they? So, ironically, the argument for the resolution of the Urama Sufi dichotomy led to the kind of denial of the very Sufi identity. So this is kind of, kind of the dilemma that as I mentioned, brought about the Sufis. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Takashi. So we are moving uh, to the third speaker of uh, this session, who is Professor Ninomiya Ayako from uh, Aoyama Gakuin University. Aoyama Gakuin is a private university in central Tokyo, which has a very strong tradition in Asian studies. Uh, especially in South Asian studies, and she is now uh, incumbent uh, teaching professor, I mean, uh, professor uh, at that university doing Indian medieval history. And the title of her paper today is Concepts of Affiliation and Membership of Tariqa, uh, Medieval India's Case. Please. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Professor Morikoto, and uh, thank you very much for giving me to the, make a presentation in this precious occasion. Okay. And uh, I stopped the humble way of Japanese expression, and I dare to say there's nothing to do with the, the order of presentation uh, between the hierarchical of uh, the relationship uh, of the, these uh, the contents. Anyway, uh, I prepared the handout uh, I asked, and uh, so it may help uh, uh, understanding. Uh, it should be in the back side of the room. So if you want some, uh, then please collect. I will modify and skip some of them, but I may read uh, the handout. Uh, this presentation allows a concept of master-disciple relationships seen in Sufi liter literature in medieval India and tries to contextualize the concept uh, de and uh, development into the history of Sufism. And uh, I explain why the master-disciple relationship is important uh, because the, the social function of uh, Sufi tariqa is uh, one, one, one of the important ones is to formalize and establish new relationship, social relationship, and then differentiate them, and uh, form the organization uh, based on the relationship. 
and uh, the method and the theory uh, to do this, uh, they have. And that is the big uh, asset for the society. And Tarika so, uh, did have the method and the theory to change the society. Uh, this is especially important for the, the, my field, the medieval India, uh, which the so-called Islamization of South Asia uh, occurred. And the formation, uh, sorry, uh, in the pre-modern time, the tariqa uh, as a social uh, entity, as uh, the most uh, common one, uh, should be the uh, group of disciples uh, affiliated to one living master. The master-disciple relationships are the principal base of such organizations. And so formation of such uh, Sufi organization must have started around the late 9th to 11th century, when Sufi masters started not only to teach mystical teachings, but to give a direction on the everyday living uh, of their disciples with more intimate relationships. Uh, so German scholar Meyer described this change as form, uh, from teaching Shaif, Shaif al-Talim to directing Shaif, Shaif al tarbiya and in the 12th century, the institutional aspect uh, boosted that tendency. And uh, in the end of, uh, by the end of 13th century, the, uh, the Sufi manual of conduct based on the, these new relationships uh, has uh, written. Uh, and I'd rather explain the change at the uh, not the whole exchange of relationship, but just additional addition of the new relationships. So one master can be the Shaif al Tarbiya and Shaif al Talib at the same time. So another important change to the master disciple relationships was that the number of the participants to Sufi movement increased since the saint worship uh, to Sufi masters emerged in 10th to 11th centuries. Uh, Sufi affiliation was no more restricted to the uh, to elite intellectuals or people who could concentrate uh, on aesthetic, uh, aesthetic, aesthetic trainings. Uh, Nizamuddin Oriya, the most famous Tishti Sufi in medieval India, was surely aware, aware of the situation. And I quoted uh, the from Sierra Oriya, uh, I skip it. And, uh, but in that quotation, Nizamuddin uh, considers that the number of Muris increased uh, from 11th century onward, uh, from the time of Abu Said Abul Hal or Shahab al-Din Surabadi, and differentiate these Muris, the, uh, the Muris, in two types. Those who come to receive mystical trainings and achieve the union with the God, namely Haas, and those who come to receive protection of Sufis hoping to enter the paradise, namely Am. Nizamandi knows that has sweet for the Sufi affiliate, but uh, doesn't deny buyer for Am and let them to his murid, to be his murid, uh, following the former Sufi, great Sufi masters. So it means that he was consciously not selective in accepting murid. He also must have known it is difficult to maintain a single common moral standard among his affiliate. Thus, he had to put a substantial effort to adjust the way of guidance and trainings for each of them, just like present uh, the university teachers, as Professor Morris told in the uh, first uh, session. And uh, in this context, the medieval India is very interesting field because the Muslim society in medieval India itself was in the, still in the forming period. Uh, most of them immigrated uh, from the Central Asia or Iran in the, uh, the, after the Mongol invasion. So the social relationships are largely uh, fluent, uh, were the, uh, more or less fluent. And in that fluent uh, society, Sufis tried to establish their, uh, their social status using the, their uh, the tools and method to establish the master-disciple relationships. Huh. And so Sufis generally admit there could be several different ways to, uh, to have relationships with a Sufi master. And uh, I skipped some part of and uh, 
And it seems that Sufis distinguish the master-disciple relationships uh, based on two sets of criteria. The way forming the relations, uh, formalizing the relationship between the master and the disciples, like rituals, like uh, buyer, or the shaving of the, uh, the hairs. Or the way uh, the master guide disciples. They will train uh, the, in the intimate relationships, or just teach, or just friendship. And uh, uh, this is clearly seen in the saying of Sharafuddin Maneri, Firdusia Shaif in 14th century India, explaining on three kinds of peers. The first is peer of Hilke, or buyer, with whom Murid does buyer, the rituals. The second is a peer of training, uh, from whom Murid get training. The third is peer of friendship, that is Sukhubat, with whom a murid is associated, just associated. The difference between a peer of buyer and other two seems, other two means peer of training and peer of friendship, uh, seems to that the murid does not have uh, did a buyer uh, with the peer. The difference between a peer of training and peer of uh, friendship uh, is that uh, the explain uh, of uh, Sharaf and Dimaneri that peer of training tells what the disciple have to do or not, while another, that is peer of friendship, just keep the disciple close with him and says nothing. The, the disciple learns by just observing the peer. So there is a difference uh, between uh, the shaykh of training and shaykh of friendship. And then, so among the rituals to formalize the master-disciple relationships, buyer, uh, the taking oath, seems to be the principal one. Nizamuddin Oriya was strongly against having buyer with several shaykhs, so was Rukunuddin Umbudan's flower deal. Uh, they are uh, the two major Sufis in medieval India. Uh, however, it seems that people who ask buyer with many masters never disappear. Thus, many chefs keep stress, uh, stressing this prohi prohibition. Nizamundi Uriya uh, reflected this rule, uh, no buyer to, with two peers, in the term, terminology on disciples. Nizamundi Uriya, uh, so I quoted Fawaid al Fuad, another saying of uh, the Nizamundi, but I, I will skip it. And uh, from this quotation, uh, Nizamuddin Oriya uh, used the term uh, murid very strictly, in which two relationships are mentioned. Uh, one is between, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, maybe. Uh, one is between Shaykh Jalaluddin Tabridi uh, and uh, Shaykh Shikabuddin Sfravadi. Another is the Shaykh, uh, with Shaykh, between Shaykh Jalaluddin Tabrizi and Shaykh Bu Said Tabrizi. Uh, the name is com confusing. Anyway, in one relationship, Shaif Jalaluddin Tabrizi was a murid, and in another, uh, was not murid. And uh, that difference uh, was based on whether he did a buyer with the peer or not. So, uh, to to the page four, uh, who shows the, uh, uh, Kshari, uh, who wrote the manual in, in 11th century, only mentions that the rule that the wife should receive his training from a single shaykh. In some occasion, the shaykh allows his student to move and attach himself to another shaykh. Uh, Nizamuddin Aulia seems to apply the rule to the usage of the term murid. In this usage, the term murid shows that the person have an exclusive relationship with my master, with buyer. Uh, on this point, a saying of Sharafuddin Maneri, uh, I already mentioned, showed this terminology was a matter of discussion among Sufis in that period. He uh, divides Sufi disciples, he means Sharafuddin Maneri, uh, divides Sufi disciples roughly two categories. One is that people, uh, that people uh, having friendships with or following to great person. Another is uh, those people who uh, uh, ask the person uh, of the uh, great person to make a ritual with them. 
So it seems that Sharafuddin Ahmad, uh, Sharafuddin Maneri personally thinks both could be called the murid. But he also admits that some Sufi chefs uh, call only the person with rituals uh, call, uh, uh, call the murid, just like Nizamuddin Uriya. So these differences in the relationships between master and the disciple were often materialized by, by difference of hirka, the clothes uh, Sufi Shaif give to the disciples. Uh, based on Awarif or Mawarif, she may say there are two kinds of hirka, and uh, the former researches I will skip. So in 14th century India, Nizamundin Oriya shows one of the most comprehensive and systematic classification of different kind of hirkas. Uh, in Shamail Ratokir, uh, another work uh, of Nizamuddin Oriya, uh, based on Nizamuddin Oriya's sayings, uh, uh, I quote it, but I will skip. Uh, five hirkas in, uh, mentioned in that Shamail Ratokir. Uh, first is Hilka uh, of Irad, Shaif gives to Murid. And another, second, sorry, uh, this one will help. Uh, second is Hilka of Mahabba, uh, which Peer gives to Murid in favor. And third is Hilka of Tabaluk, which uh, Peer gives to the person other than Murid. And uh, fourth is Hirka of Sufba, also given to the pe uh, people, those who are not Marids. And uh, the last, fifth, is the uh, Hirka of True Irana, Hakiki. So these uh, five Hirkas, uh, among these five Hirkas, Hirka of Irana seems to be given to Murid at the time of Baya, and Hirka of Mahaba is for Murid too. Hilka of Tabaluk and Sufuna were four numbers. And uh, the difference between uh, them is, I repeat, whether the Shaif give guidance, uh, sorry, uh, difference between Hilka of Mahabba and Hilka of Tabaluk uh, seems to be the whether the Shaif give guidance to the receiver or what's not, just favor. Hilka of Hakiki is just for selected read, so leave it. So, taken together with the Nizamuddin Oriya's usage of the term murid, the differences between whether he has a buyer or not, uh, we can see that the element which makes the difference uh, and cons uh, difference are consistent with the criteria to distinguish the master-disciple relationships. So the way formalizing the relationship between the master and disciples uh, with a buyer or with a writer and the second, the, the way the master guides disciples. So it can be made in this very systematic table. And I, add, I added table on the page seven in the handout. So, and these various hirkas are distributed according to Shaif's decision at the time of buyer and later. And in other things, Nizamuddin explains how he had distributed the hirkas of the people. I skipped the quotation, anyway. So Nizamuddin Oriya said, uh, people to whom he had hirka of Irada were very rare. So, and there was an alternative for the hirka of Irada, that is hirka of Tawa and Tabaluk. So this distribution of hirka seems to be consistent with has arm classification of murid quoted in the beginning. So in sum, from this classification of disciples and whether they did buyer with the master or not, and what they received from the shaif, we can make the systematic table and uh, the figure uh, to distinguish master-disciple relationships. One is this table. And another is this figure. Uh, there are four kinds of murids. Has with, uh, with buyer, uh, has with, arm with buyer, 
house without budget. Um, without budget. This uh, the does not mean any, anything. Just the making figure. I, I put this like this. And house with buyer receive hilka wirada mahaba or true wirada maybe, and they receive mystical trainings. And arm with buyer receive hilka wirada and mahaba, and they receive fever. And house without buyer will receive hilka of suba and mystical training. And arm without buyer will receive hilka of tabaluk and fever. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, in 13th to 14th century Delhi, uh, there were close interrelationships between members of Chishti and Sufraradi series here. They are competing. Kiwamura uh, Kai, the Malfuzad, uh, written in Dekan, uh, contains a chapter on Ulama and Shaifs who had a friendly relationship with Nidamuddin Oriya. Uh, of Chishti, in which nine out of 13 persons were married or had a relationship with Muritans Flavaradiya, different cities here. So it, the, their relationships are very complicated, actually. So, as we saw in the saying of Nizamuddin Oriya, Nizamuddin Oriya's affiliate range from those who had the, the, the exclusive relationship with the, uh, him, the Murid, to the loose, uh, the friendly relationships. So uh, the, I can say that tactics of Nizamuddin Oriel is to keep the core member of his uh, tariqa, his group, uh, as a murid who has the exclusive relationships, and at the same time uh, to let them have uh, the the uh, interaction with uh, the other Sufi chefs by other kind of relationships. So membership controls are strict. At the same time, roots. And, and it is materialized that Hilka. So the, they, they uh, Nizamuddin says only Shaif knows what the Hilka, uh, what, which kind of Hilka was given. Anyway, the disciples surely had known which kind of relationship they have. Or it was, let's say, it was demanded to to know. Anyway, so it see it shows that Nizamuddin Oriya was very conscious about the managing of his organization, and he was very good organizer on, on that aspect. And the, the way he explains is also very systematic. So and uh, it this the uh, skill of Nizam Dioria as an able organizer surely have com uh, contributed to his success as a su great Sufi chef and also his uh, tariqa he belonged, the Chishtiya. Uh, sorry for the confusing. Anyway, it's end. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we are now moving to the fourth speaker of the session, who is Dr. Ogura Satoshi. Uh, Dr. Ogura is affiliated to an institute whose name is rather long, <laughs> Institute of Languages and Cultures of Asia and Africa, uh, which is attached to Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. Uh, his uh, title is uh, Indic Deities Translated by Means of the Oneness of Existence. And it has, I think, a subtitle too. Yes, uh, uh, the subtitle is uh, In the Case of Muhammad Shahabadi's Persian Translation of the Raja Tanginis. Thank you very much. Then please go on. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for Professor Morimoto for uh, introducing about me. And also, I would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, and the staffs of the, uh, this uh, symposium. It is very uh, glad uh, for me to be here. And uh, uh, 
my research topic is the uh, following Inomiya san, uh, the history of South Asia during Sultanate and Mughal period. And today's uh, speech is about the translation strategy of a Persian translation of a Sanskrit classic. Okay, I start. In South Asia, the formative 14th to 18th centuries witnessed that Sanskrit and Persian coexisted as the languages of cultural activities, and that intellectuals and poets of the period performed hundreds of Persian translations and adaptations of Sanskrit texts by which Sanskrit knowledge systems, philosophies, and stories became known in Persian-speaking Muslim society and influenced on the making of a distinct realm of the Persianate culture on the subcontinent. In the case of the Mughal Empire, in particular during the Third Emperor Akbar's period, Sanskrit texts were translated more vigorously. Akbar set the translation bureau in his new capital, Fatehpur Sikri, in which a large number of Sanskrit epics, stories, scientific works, etc., etc., were translated into Persian. The translation movements of the Sultanate and Mughal periods have attracted the attention of scholars for decades. However, apart from the works by a few scholars, including uh, Professor Ernst, Roderick Basir, Zweibo Donofurio, and Kazuyo Sakaki, scholarly achievement had rarely moved beyond enumerating the titles of the translations. Fortunately, such situation has been gradually improved in the past 10 years, and one of the promising projects is that this, uh, the international research project, the Perso Indica, uh, run by uh, Professor Ernst, as well as Professor Fabrizio Speziale, of the Noe Sorbonne Paris third. Studies in Indo-Persian translation texts, as Ernst notices, have potential for development of sophisticated approach to the inner cultural activities in South Asia that can avoid essentialism, reductionism to the assumed ideal types of Islam or Hinduism, and the problematic concept of syncretism because this approach rather focuses on the activities and creativities of translators than static end results or dehistoricized entities. However, the analysis procedure of a translation text has yet to be adequately established, and we seek and try multiple methods borrowing from similar and close research fields. One promising procedure is utilizing the framework of translation strategies in the field of linguistics. In his in-depth study on the 18th century Bengali text, Tony K. Stewart displayed a convincing application of the translation theory as a humanitical model established by Eugene Nida to South Asian translation texts. More recently, uh, Francesca Orsini extended the range of application of Tony Stewart's translation theory to a literary text, that is, the Rushido Nama of Abdul Kudus Gangohi. Another approach attaches value to their co uh, contextual particularities in the target cultural field. In the case of Indo-Persian translation movement, that was Sufism. Shankar Nair has outlined how Sufi worldview and the concept of the oneness of existence innerly worked as medium and method of the translation movement in his case study of an annotated translation of the Lagu Yoga Vasishta by a Sahvid Shi philosopher, Mir Fendrski. Indeed, the author of Fendersky's source text, Nizamuddin Panipati, who translated the Lagu Yoga Vasishta from Sanskrit under the order of the Prince Salim, explicitly states his interpretation on Indic deities and philosophies, which supports Nile's argument. Quote, Brahmins of India have a religious sect of preceding wise men concerning the oneness of the real essence, praise be to him and the exalted his perfect attributions and the stages of descending, the source of plurality and the manifestation of the world and worldly beings. If a difference between the source and the, the target is found, it will be due to the issue of terminology and variety of tongues. A Kashmiri pundit named Abhinanda, the author of the epitomized text of the Yoga Vasishya, explained the name of the omnipotence his name is glorified and praise be to the God, the exalted, at the beginning of his abridgment. Know that the names of the real, the exalted, do not have limit and direct conscription, and each one of Hindu riches and followers of the way to the real choose one of his names, 
which are counted as avatars, or the stages of his self-disclosures, original word is tajaliyat, and they matter the name, unquote. Panipati's claim is clear. Hindu Brahmins had established the similar concept with the oneness of existence preceding Ibn Arabi, that is, non-dualistic Vedanta, the underlying philosophy of the Sanskrit source text, the Yoga Vasishta. And the names of Indic deities should be interpreted as divine names of the real, through which the absolute existence discloses it, itself into plural beings. Uh, likewise, uh, as Professor Ernst has made clear, in the treatise of Vedanta philosophy, uh, the Sharikul Marifa was illuminator of Gnosis, uh, the possible author, uh, Abrufai's Faizi, uh, interprets the Lord Krishna as the essence of God and the manifestation of divinity whose definition cannot be described. These accounts affirm that such tendency of interpretation was shared among the Muslim translators in the period to a certain extent. But the results of the previous studies lead us to a simple question. Were all Indic deities interpreted as manifestations of the absolute existence or divine names, we have yet to accumulate comprehensively comparative studies between Sanskrit source texts and Persian target texts. Therefore, in this presentation, I offer a case study that thoroughly surveys examples of translation, the translating Indic deities in the Persian translation of a Sanskrit classic. The text I take up today is the Persian translation of the Raja Tranginis, a series of Sanskrit chronicles of Kashmir written in the style of Kavya or poetry, composed by Karhana and other Kashmiri pundits. The translator is a Muslim interaction named Mullah Shah Muhammad Shahabadi. He accompanied the third Mughal Emperor Akbar to the capital of Kashmir, Srinagar, in June 1589, and completed to translate the Sanskrit chronicles during their stay in the city under the Emperor's royal order. In 1589, Abdul Qadir Badawuni, a Muslim chronicler and current head of the translation bureau in Fatehpur Sikri, revised Shahabadi's translation into a simplified style. No. Oh, sorry. Ah, um, uh, uh, yes, this uh, figure is correct. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, thus far, three manuscripts of the Persian translation of the Raja Tranginis related to Akbar's court have survived, all of which contain the text of Shahabadi's translation. We shall focus on Shahabadi's translation strategy on the notions on Indic deities, but before dealing with the Persian translation, let us pass here to observe briefly how Muslim authors interpreted Indic deities and represented them, referring to authentic Arabic and Persian text composed before the establishment of the Mughal Empire. One of the greatest Muslim intellectuals of the 11th century, Abu Raihan al-Biruni, realistically explains Indic deities in his Kitab Tafkik Maril Hindu as what Hindus worship, with promises that Hindus totally differ from us in religion. They never accept what we believe and vice versa. Some decades after al-Biruni, uh, Abu Fat of Muhammad Shafrastani composed his Kitab al-Miral wa Nihar that informs his understanding on Indic deities. According to uh, Professor Lawrence's outstanding work on the Shafrastani's work, uh, Shafrastani following preceding authors such as Ibn an nadim Magdisi, Gyardizi, and Marwazi chiefly regards Indic deities as angels sent by Allah, transcribing correctly each name of deities. The next important work treating Indic religions by the hand of a Muslim is the chapter of India in the Jamia Tabarif of the Ilhanid court by Zeb Rashid he, uh, His translation strategy on Indic deities is not consistent. Although in every case he translated Buddha as prophet, he at one point translated Indic deities such as Shiva Vishnu as prophets who established their sects, while at other points as Firishta, Marak, or angels sent by Allah. And goes on to call Brahma the king of nature. Let us leave the preceding Persian works and turn to discuss Shahabadi's translation. Indeed, 
uh, through a careful reading of his translation, we can find that Shafrastani and Shahabadi employed multiple translation strategies to indicate dates and the conditions by which one strategy is properly selected and applied to are consistent throughout the translation. For Shahabadi, being a Muslim, the deity is of course Allah. Thus, Shahabadi does not shy away from using the words Allah, Ilahi in Arabic, and Khoda, Khoda Band in Persian. When two kinds of general terms appear in the Sanskrit source text, he replaces with such Arabic and Persian words that mean God. One is the Sanskrit terms that mean creator. Another is the terms that mean fate. An example of the former type of strategy is uh, this quotation. And the, you can find uh, on my uh, handout. Uh, in Sanskrit source text, uh, I read only the English translation. Alas, the creator did not give descendants to the king as if a sandal tree does not bear flower and a champaka tree does not bear fruit. In Persian translation, Jonah Raja Pandit says, because, of the cust because custom of Allah is carried out, a defect appears even in perfect beings. For example, a sandal tree does not bear flower in spite of its good smell, and a champaka tree does not bear fruit in spite of its good smelled flower. The king, in spite of his high position and perfectiveness, did not have descendant. From these quotations, we can find easily that Shahabadi translated creator's will into Allah's Allah, an important term of Asharite theology that means his custom. Interestingly, when Shahabadi translated such general Sanskrit terms that mean creator, he does not use Arabic and Persian words of creator, such as Kharik and Afarid God. The latter type of strategy applied to the Sanskrit word Daiba, whose meaning is fate, appears in the following examples. Uh, you can see the other examples on my handout. And, uh, Okay, I read the, only the English translation. Because, because of the requirement of the destiny and for ordainment of Allah, uh, correct, uh, that, sorry, uh, Sanskrit translation, uh, I should uh, read first. The Sanskrit text, when the Brahmans saw him by the way of fate, they became of one accord. And its Persian translation, because of the requirement of the destiny and for ordainment of Allah, Brahmans, whose opinions have never been in accord, decided blah, blah, blah. Since he interpreted Sanskrit words meaning fate as one who for ordained fate and one of Allah's aspects as well as creator, Shahabadi translated two kinds of Sanskrit words, creator and fate, into Allah, Ilahi, and Khoda in an integral manner. By contrast with the general words of creator and fate, for epithetic names and by names of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, and other pranic deities, such as Indra, Yama, Kubera, and Rudra, Shahabadi borrows original words from Sanskrit or replaces their by names with their original names. In translating epithetic names, he never replaced with Allah, Khoda, etc., etc. In addition, Shahabadi often displays his identification of epithetic names of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva with a manifestation of Hak. The case of Shiva is here. Come to the place of Mahadeva, who is the highest of elevated beings and the presence of the real. His majesty is exalted. And uh, the example of Vishnu is here. It is said that Narayana, who is interpreted as the real, praise be to him and exalted. According to them, that is, Vaishnavas, carries out four important works in Vishnu's four avatars. And the case of Brahma is here. Ah, sorry, I skipped the disk, yes. <laughs> sorry. Uh, summing up the above examples, we can diagram like this table. The general Sanskrit terms meaning creator and fate are translated into Allah while epithetic names of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva are interpreted as Hak. Such proper usage seems that Shahabadi adapts the hierarchical order between Allah and Hak, 
in divine manifestation to the relationship between general Sanskrit terms and the epithetic names of the three deities. Shahabadi applies Hak to only Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. We never find such kind of strategy when other Brahmic deities are translated. He expresses instead each deity's attributions or functions without regarding them as gods. For example, Indra is expressed as Padushahi Aprejanat was the emperor of celestial beings. This translation seems to be based on deification of Indra in ancient period that regards Indra not as the guardian of the east direction but as a king of heaven and devas. His translation of Deva into Aprejanat suggests he does not regard Indra as a deity. Likewise, Yama is expressed as Manakurmut, or the angel of death, Israel. And Kubera as, uh, is interpreted as Dib, or Demo, who sits in the north and who collects treasure. One remarkable exception is the case to translate Lakshmi, the Hindu goddess of fortune and prosperity for whom Shahabadi employs a different strategy. Throughout the text of his translation, borrowing the name Lakshmi appears only once, where her name is followed by the synonymous word Daura. In all other cases, Shahabadi replaces Lakshmi with Daura, or Daura of Dunya. Here is an example of such translation strategy. Uh, in Sanskrit texts, as he was marching to Barahamura, he captured a host of auspicious monks which had come from the enemy's force and which seemed to represent the royal fortune, Lakshmi. And in Persian translation, when Uchara arrived at Barahamura, his men captured a male which had come from Raja's troop. Uchara threw out it a good omen that Raja's daughter comes to him. In Sanskrit epics and poems, a king is frequently depicted as a husband of a female deity. In case a king is depicted as a husband of the earth, uh, for example, the earth is personified as a woman who seeks a king, embraces him, marries him, and mourns him. According to Minoru Hara, who investigated thoroughly the aspects of female deities as mistress of a king, has pointed out that the, the most distinctive feature of Lakshmi which differentiates her from other goddesses lies in her mobility and instability due to the fact that she has her own will and behaves as she likes. Lakshmi's mobility is seen mostly in connection with the transfer of power. Thus, when Lakshmi moves from one person to another person as she likes, the power which legitimates one's domination also moves accompanied with her from one person to another person. In Islamic side, the word Daura does not appear in Quran. Instead of this, the words derived from the same verb root appear twice, Duratan and Nudawiha. According to Franz Rosenthal, the word Daura, which initially means to move aimlessly to town and to alternate, came to mean rule and dynasty during the early, early Abbasid Caliphate. This semantic development of the world is presumably based on the idea that one's sovereignty and cycles of political power uh, depend on celestial fortune. However, as is well known, this world has kept its original meaning of uh, transitory fortune, which moves from one person to another. Therefore, we can interpret Shahabadi's translation strategy uh, in these cases in which Lakshmi is replaced with Daga. It's based on the equivalence between these two words, both of which mean transitory fortune, giving power to one person. For the juxtapos uh, juxtaposition of Daga and Dunya as being equivalent to Lakshmi in the translation, it is likely that another equivalence lies between Lakshmi and Dunya in terms of their character of Vitreya. From Sanskrit side, Lakshmi is characterized as a weak goddess who abandons a man whom she got close when he loses power. From Islamic side, on the other hand, theologians and poets frequently use the metaphor to compare this world, dunya, with this royal women in order to claim to get rid of the attachment to this world and devote oneself to the next world. 
In this case, uh, Shahabadi translated Lakshmi into two words that reflect her function and character. One is mobile royal fortune, and another is her frequency. Uh, sorry, I have to skip the case of Buddha, uh, also this is uh, very interesting. Uh, I hope to find another opportunity to uh, speak about this in more detail. On these grounds, I have come to the conclusion. Throughout the Persian translation of the Raja Tranginis, Muhammad Shahabadi differentiates three Indic deities, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, from other deities, equating them with Hak. In addition, Shahabadi properly uses the words Allah and Hak. The former is applied to when he translated a general term that means creator and fate, while the latter is applied to when he translated an epithetic name or by name of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. His usage suggests that he thought only the three deities can be regarded as forms of manifestation of the real. For other deities, he, inter he interpreted as creatures, such as the case of Yama, or depersonified into a concept, such as the case of Lakshmi and Dara. Uh, this presentation uh, showed a case study dealing with the translation. Accumulating comparative, uh, comparative studies of other Persian translations in the uh, Sultanate and Mughal periods can contribute to depicting more clear images on the limits of Sufism and the concept of the oneness of existence as medium and method in the translation movement. And uh, pick, uh, the images of Indic deities uh, whose, uh, who, uh, which I put on my uh, PowerPoint file are all in Kyoto. And, uh, uh, you can uh, see these uh, images in the Sanju Sangendo, uh, and the Hoshakuji Temple, and the Joruji Temple. Uh, please enjoy Kyoto. Thank you. Uh, before you go out town to see those uh, statues, there is Q&A time. So those who want to pose questions or make comments, please raise your hand. question just only I would like to uh, add uh, some information from Ottoman uh, Sayyids and Sheikhs position uh, in the Ottoman land uh, you know uh, Ottomans uh, were paying much appreciation and uh, respect towards to activate uh, for example if anybody could prove that uh, his genealogy of carrying this noble blood, uh, he will be exempted from the military service and uh, of taxes, also exempted from taxes. Of course, because of this kind of advantages, uh, some evil intended people uh, will always attempt to misclaim that they were sages. Uh, in order to solve this problem uh, and keep the records of those who are true, those true sages of Ottoman lands, uh, Ottomans officially established a governmental body, uh, or let's say a ministry, uh, called Nakib al Ashraf. So uh, the head of this ministry was himself, as I should say it. Uh, Nakib al-Ashraf himself was a Sayyid and was a representative uh, of all Sayyids and was taking care of their welfare all over the empire. And in the morning uh, special uh, occasion, in the morning of first day of crowning the Sultan, uh, uh, the first day of his Sultanate, new Sultan must be consecrated by this Nakib al-Ashraf uh, by girding him a sword on in Ayyub Sultan in Istanbul. 
So uh, I would like to uh, add this information to your studies. Thank and you very secondly, uh, this is one information. Uh, in Seyits in Turkey, they recently established a foundation, Foundation of Seyits, and they are organizing each year a yearly meetings of Seyits. For your information. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah, actually, uh, I invited Professor Luya Kluc, if you know her. Uh, who is a specialist from Konya, yeah, 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 yes. uh, Hajitepe University uh, to the conference and she is uh, the contributor uh, to the volume I mentioned. So the Ottoman, of course, presence is there in Saeed <laughs> Shari Baruti. Thirdly, maybe lastly, you were looking for some sports somewhere. The uh, head of this foundation of Seyits in Turkey is a very rich uh, businessman in Turkey, so you can get in touch with them. Oh yeah, that's very interesting. There are, yes, similar uh, organizations in Arab countries too, and uh, one which is rather active in Saudi Arabia is also headed by a rich businessman, it seems. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we still have time and I can accept one question or comment. So if somebody came up with anything. Yes. Uh, thank you all of you uh, for uh, your very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, but uh, uh, I'd like to uh, particularly ask uh, Nino Mia san. <laughs> uh, 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 I'd like to ask Nizamuddin um, Aurier's uh, uh, intention behind his uh, strategy to reform uh, uh, master disciple relationship. Uh, for example, in case of Central Asia, uh, according to uh, European power, uh, the uh, Himaya system uh, pro protect, pro protect, protecting... Excuse me, Professor Nakanishi, I have this paper which tells that I have to finish the session at 12, uh, 20, so ah, can you pause your okay, question, okay, please? Okay, okay, so uh, what... <laughs> Uh, what what kind of uh, so social condition uh, uh, progress needed to tra transform uh, relations master disciple relationship for Nizamuddin Aulia? Uh, thank you very much for the question, and uh, I still don't have the, the how do you say final and solid uh, answer for it. But I guess that the. First of all, I have to say Nizamuddin didn't do, the, do any kind of reform. I think just he form the systematized something uh, existed to the more the uh, comprehensive way, and uh, he had to do it because uh, I, I guess uh, the comp he was competing with Sprawardi uh, Shaifs, so the. I am sure there was a serious competition on human resources in Delhi when Nizamuddin Oriya was uh, active. So for the, uh, the keeping this, uh, I don't know, no, so, so to the competing the rival resources, he, had, he cannot limit his way to keep disciples to the elitist way or the popular way. So he has to manage both. That is the, uh, the temporal answer. Okay, uh, now I'd like to close this session. Uh, I thank all the presenters uh, and the audience for the participation. Uh, I think it's lunch time now. So after upload, lunch, please. Thank you very much, professors.